Let's see. Okay, we're live. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the inauguration of the JAX Global Meetup. As you know, we're today with uh, Rohan Anil from Google and, and Boris from a lot of places, Crayon and Hugging Face. And uh, Weights and Biases. And Weights and Biases. <laughs> uh, all the cool, all the cool names. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, like well, scalable second order optimization for deep learning with Rohan. Hopefully, he shows us a lot of the cool stuff uh, around the distributed shampoo package, and he promised other stuff he's doing. Uh, so, that would be interesting. Uh, to begin with, I wanted to, like, I don't know, give a little bit of a shout out to the uh, JAX Global Meetup group that uh, started a while ago, uh, but um, we've been doing it initially with uh, weights and biases, the, the old JAX talks uh, saga that went for a while. Uh, recently, uh, I joined efforts with Google Developer Experts I think Boris did as well. So, yeah, um, like we, we, in the future, I think we'll be doing stuff more on the Google side. Uh, but people should hopefully, if you want to get like updates of the future talks, the, join the group. Like that will be. Um, Hopefully, we build a community there. Obviously, we share it on, on, on Twitter and like other other media. But uh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Without further ado, um, Rohan, it's all <laughs> yours. Um, uh, people from before we start, people from from the chat, uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, we agreed to interrupt Rohan, so this is more interactive. And, and yeah, maybe we'll ask questions ourselves too, so it's a little bit more dynamic. Uh, All right. So, yeah, Rohan, introduce yourself, please. Hi. Um, so, can I see the chat here on the StreamYard, or is it you know, some other UI? Yeah, do you see it at the right? Uh, it says private chat and comments, right? Uh, maybe comments. Again, yeah, comments, comments. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, anyway, uh, tell you if there's uh, right. a comment. All right, I think I can get started. I'm Ron Manel. I work at Google. Uh, the talk is going to be on scalable second order optimization for deep learning. I'll cover two algorithms in detail shampoo and local prop. And yeah, free, free to interrupt me at any time and on any slide. Um, the main uh, focus of our work has been on making neural network training efficient at scale. And this talk is about shampoo and local prop. Uh, the reason we work on training efficiency is that we've reached a plateau in terms of improvement we can get from first order methods, both in terms of steps to convergence and how fast we could make each step. Why is it called shampoo? It has to do with preconditioning. <laughs> And why is it called local prop? Because it does local loss optimization. So uh, before we go into the details of shampoo, I wanted to give anyone who's uh, new to, uh, intuitive explanation of what preconditioning means. We're trying to minimize this function f and your weights in Rd. And for t steps, you would compute, uh, move in the negative direction of your gradient. But in this case, you can pre-multiply the gradient with this ht matrix. If ht is the second order derivative, you get Newton step. And for exponential family of losses, you get natural gradient. And in the online setting, you get full matrix adagrad. And shampoo is derived as an approximation to full matrix adagrad, although you will see similarities between method versus other higher order methods. On the right, we have a very simple problem. It's a quadratic, two parameters. It's a uh, rotated ellipse along the axis. 
And if you apply gradient descent on those two parameters, you would see that gradient descent bounces off the level curves of the function to the minima. Assuming you had a preconditioner that you can apply to the gradient at every step, you can get a straight shot to the minima in case of the Newton update. Moreover, you can think of it geometrically as making the loss landscape more spherical so that you can get to the minimum. So, so I have a question. Um, when you say like a, it's a second order method, it doesn't mean necessarily second order derivative, right? No, uh, absolutely. So it uh, second order in this in the sense of second order moments of the gradient rather than second derivative. So for the Newton method, you would get the second derivative. For the Fisher, for a linear uh, uh, problem, you would see that actually both are the same. And in terms of uh, online, in the online setting, we are actually approximating the second moments of your gradient as you as you receive it. Uh, I just want to clarify something. Like th that means there's no inter. Are there interactions, or are there are no interactions between like the parameters? A great question. There's a visualization uh, next. There is uh, interaction. So you, you do look at the correlations of gradients, gradients of gradients of different parameters, and that's why we call it the full matrix preconditioner because it's an n square matrix where n is the number of parameters. All right. So uh, the core operation of um, let me see if I can. Uh, okay, this is good. So the core operation of um, full matrix at a grad preconditioner is the following. You'd get gradients at each step and you take outer products. And this was based on two papers published from Google at around the same time. And uh, the preconditioner is formed by accumulating the gradient outer products across all time steps and taking the square root of that matrix, HD. In practice, if you uh, think about implementing this for a neural network, you if you have a fully connected network of 3.5k times 2k, you would need about, and if you flatten that into a gradient vector, you would need about 43 trillion weights to actually take care of all the correlations between all the gradients of parameters. Clearly, we don't do this. Right? So what's used in practice is we just take the diagonal entries of this matrix. So the diagonal entries can be computed in linear time because it's Hadamard product or element wise product of G, GI and GI. And the computation is also cheap because the square root is just element wise square root. So when I say uh, at diagonal adagrat, it applies to all the other methods. For example, if you add moving averages to diagonal adagrat, you would get RMS problem. So instead of having the window be all the time steps that you've seen so far, you make, make it an exponential moving average, you get RMS prop, and then you add momentum on top of it and add bias correction, you get Adam. So these uh, modifications also apply to everything that I say uh, in, in the next set of slides. So I like to think of all these optimization methods in terms of its computational complexity and memory, because it's usually when when uh, the trade there are trade-offs between that, and it depends on which problem you're working on. So, for example, full matrix adagrad is just uh, added here, and for a fully connected layer, you can see that this is infeasible. There's no, no, nothing that we can do. And we sh we usually are in this regime where everything is linear in memory and linear in computation time. And so today we are going to talk about shampoo and local prop. Shampoo reduces the computational complexity and memory to uh, memory to the square of the dimension of the tensor rather than the total number of parameters and cubic in the dimension as well, the computational cost. For local prop, it's actually linear in terms of memory usage, but the computational cost scales depending on the batch size and the number of iterations, which is uh, small. So depending on the regime that you work on, one method would work much faster in terms of its step time, at least. So these are some of the papers that uh, uh, these algorithms are based on. Shampoo was published in ICML 2018, and then we modified it in a couple of ways to make it work at scale, and that's distributed shampoo. 
it included some ideas from grafting. That's this disentangling adaptive gradient methods from learning rates. So shampoos, when I say is one of the higher order methods, there are many. The, there is KFAC, there are KBFGS, there's many variations of KFAC. And now you have shampoo and then uh, you have tensor normal training that's very closely related to shampoo. And there's also non-chronical factored ver versions. So these are just the chronical factored versions and the non-chronical factored versions include Hessian free optimization, Ida Hessian, GGT, and many more. This is, this is like not even the entire set of methods that have been published in this area. So um, the topic of this work is, uh, this talk is going to be about shampoo, the next set of slides. So shampoo, as I said, is an approximation to full matrix at a guard. And in the next slide, I'll actually walk you through an example of how the approximation is set up. It makes use of smaller matrices to approximate this big, large 53 trillion uh, uh, parameter weight matrix that you saw earlier. Right? So let's take a very simple example. On the right, you have this uh, feed forward network fully connected. And let's try to apply shampoo to the first layer of the network. So you have the parameters of the network is a matrix of size four by five, right? And you would compute gradients for it. And that would also give you a, a four by five matrix, right? Now just go along with me and I'll, uh, these are the two statistics that you have to actually calculate to implement shampoo. The first one is L, the second one is R. One is called the left statistics. The R is the right statistics. For L, let's, multiply the gradient matrix with its transpose. And for R, let's take the gradient transpose and then multiply with itself. Okay. So G, G transpose and G transpose G. And let's accumulate this across all time steps. Clearly, as I said before, you could change it to moving averages and all the other modifications. Right? But general kernel of the idea is here. And if you were to do full matrix cytograd, where you wanted to compute the correlations between gradients of different parameters, what you would do is take the gradient vector for this fully can, for, for this first layer, which is a four by five matrix, and you would vectorize it to get a 20 dimensional vector, right? And then you take the outer products and that would be a 20 by 20 matrix. But as you can see, like this is quite large for practical problems and the main, uh, the main algebra that shampoo proves is that the following Lorner order holds. So this is the full A is the full matrix adagrad matrix. Here it's a on the right it's a chronicle product between two matrices L and R. Since there are two of them, you can think of it as a like intuitively as a geometric mean. That is why there is a square root. Here. All right. So sketch of the shampoo update in its like, cleanest form is that you update the statistics at each step. And I actually didn't say, I said chronicle product, but I didn't actually say how the chronicle product actually would be implemented in terms of uh, we use a property of the chronicle product to move around and make it matrix multiply. So the actual update rule, you don't actually have to create the full matrix. Instead, you can get your gradient at that time step, which is a matrix pre-multiply it with a preconditioner on the left and post-multiply it with a preconditioner on the right. Now these preconditioners are formed by taking the inverse fourth root of the matrices that we just calculated, LT and RT. Now that becomes the more complicated part because typically in first order methods, you just take square roots, right? Now we just said, oh, we need actually matrix inverse <laughs> square roots. Mm -hmm. Now things starts breaking down in terms of practice. One of the challenges with the following higher order method that I said, which kind of motivates for Locoprop and other types of methods is that for at least NLP, like we've been building larger and larger models. And the way we made these models larger either is a combination of increasing the number of layers, in which case you can apply shampoo to every layer or increasing the width of the layer but now you can see increasing the width of the layer actually makes shampoo more expensive because of its dependence on the dimension, which is the width of the layer, right? 
So we need to do something about this as well. So I'll talk about that in the next set of slides. So this one is for large embedding layers. So you would have a tensor of vocab size, comma, dims, right? So usually vocab size is quite large. So one thing you could do intuitively is just, you know, we were taking a geometric mean between two quantities. Let's just use one of them as the estimate. So let's just use the right preconditioner. And that actually works quite well. Like for example, for the softmax layer, we do not precondition that, just use diagonal method. But if you precondition that, you get a slight improvement and this improvement is worth the computational comp uh, increase. Okay. Rohan, so can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I think well, it's kind of being devil's advocate here, or maybe just for the benefit of the of the audience. Um, when you do the math, you you don't actually care about layer structure, right? Uh, you, you you build a vector of all params, but yeah. So shampoo does uh, started with it treats each gradient, uh, each uh, layer as in the parameters of the network independently. Each layer independently, and when I say a layer, like the abstraction is a bit leaky. Depends on how you would implement it. In terms of JAX, it would be the group of parameters that's just one variable or one parameter, um, and the great, and then it's only defined on top of that. So you could make shampoo work worse. For example, I'll show you some of the practical things that we do to avoid uh, making the estimate worse. For example, you can add an extra dimension of one to the tensor, and shampoo would come up with a completely different preconditioner than if you didn't have that one because it's defined on the shape of the tensors. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. Just to clarify, uh, this is per, I guess, how, how do you call it, a parameter in the PyTorch world, or? Oh, uh, uh, PyTorch. Uh, uh, in in Jax, it's uh, your yeah, gradient. Each each each, uh, each, each, each parameter. Has, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's they based on the shape of the tensor. So. Okay. Yeah. That's it's think, metrics. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. So. Now this makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing is that typically maybe this is more unusual, but you might have a place like, for example, recommendation systems where you have vocab is actually quite large. So in this case, two hundred million. So taking the right preconditioner is computationally infeasible because even there's a dependence on that dimension. So what we actually can do if if certain properties hold, if it's like one hot and lookups are uh, like univalent, is that you can actually compute the right preconditioner by just taking the gradient with respect to the input layer and adapting it to compute the right preconditioner. So we actually do that for a Critio ML perf problem where we actually find significant improvement with shampoo, where we find that uh, we can train it in half the time um, and get to better quality using all the time. And that quality is much better than increasing the model size by about 8x for that mm. problem. How, how do, I mean, this may be thinking of the API, but how, how, API-wise, yeah, how very, do you do this? So for in the JAX implementation, we recently added support for adding the right preconditioner. You can actually pass in which preconditioner you want, all left, right, and there's an automatic mode to figure out which one's the smaller one, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for the big one, you actually have to do it in your code because that's more complicated API-wise. So it's not in the JAX world, but you can uh, make that work because the rest of the code is there for inverse peer through and doing all the preconditioning. In the other case, this is mostly where most people are, which is to increase the dense layers, make it wider or uh, like larger. We actually do something very simple. We just block diagonalize it. What I mean is we split the layers into smaller blocks and preconditioner each one of those. Now, it turns out when we do that, we actually get a slight improvement in quality, which although this is an approximation to suppose, and that's, I would think of as like, you know, uh, I mean, it's it's not a huge improvement, so it could be experimental noise, but I've noticed there's a cross experiments across pipelines, and I expect that to be, now we kind of bias it, there is like, 
the higher order method and also um, like a first order on top. So it's like within the blocks, it's higher order. Across blocks, it's still kind of first order-ish. So that seems to have some bias towards slightly better generalization. So would it make sense to try to use like small blocks like if you have a if you have a layer of 4000 parameters uh typically typically me i was thinking of doing a blocks of a thousand um yeah but I, would it make sense to try like tiny blocks and it would go faster and except uh compilers get in the way where you know splitting and concatenating is actually turns into a compilation uh, overhead issue where um, it would take a, the program will be getting larger, although we might be able to do something in the forward pass to keep the model in certain shape so that the shampoo, you don't have to do any of that in the backward pass, but in the forward pass, we might have to do a reshape or a split and concat. So it might be possible. So, uh, so kind of what we did for ResNet 50, although the layers there are in quite large, we used a block size of 128 by 128, and this is what we used for the ML perf training submission, where we get state of the art results within both steps and wall time against highly optimized first order methods. So it's like, you know, really hard to get those improvements because it's being optimized for like multiple years in ML perf, mm -hmm. and then we came in and submitted. So here is another thing that I mentioned. We call it the best effort shape interpretation equal to true flag, which is always true. Um, we reshape the gradient so that you know small dimensions are kind of coalesced together. It's really just two few things, like the dimension one is removed, and now the three by three uh, dimensions are grouped together so that you get get exploit more correlation, right? And you, you do see some improvements from these things. And this actually also helps if you, I found it that like, you know, uh, for performance reasons, you might want to keep your weight matrices in shared and shapes, but that might not be good for the actual optimization. So there's trade-offs, right? Uh, people try different layouts of your parameters for performance, but then in the optimization phase, like because we're talking about correlations, it kind of messes things up. So we kind of do some, try to do something basic to make it work in the default setting. But you could do more if you inspect the matrices. Another thing uh, maybe worth mentioning here is that typically weights and biases are separate tensors or mat uh, a matrix and a vector that's instantiated separately. But if you instantiate it together, you actually can precondition them together too. And that actually improves even the wall time of shampoo because now you have one less um, inverse be a throat to worry about and preconditioning biases seem wasteful because you only have n parameters and you have to create an n square preconditioner right? so th these are like kind of up to algorithm bleeding into the api difficulties and which is one of the reasons why higher order methods have been challenging by uh, default, when you do a flex like dense layer, the bias is a different parameter, or it's it's a different oh, parameter. Different. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Maybe you can fuse the. Uh, I know just by <laughs> searching for names, the kernels and the bias. Yeah. See, then it becomes an API. So yeah. This is, yeah. Um. Okay. So uh, inverse peer throat. So we just take the classic. Newton method of solving this problem, x to the power p a minus equal to identity. If you take the Newton method and derive that, you get this update rule where if you keep iterating, you will get to the solution. Actually, it turns out that this is a very unstable method in floating point. So some people, folks have actually modified it and called it the couple Newton method. And the real modification is that you rewrite it as two variables instead of one variable that you're optimizing, which is x, k you write mk is equal to x to the power pk at times a and that gives you two iterates that once you iterate one of them go to the inverse pth root the other goes to identity and this is what we actually implement now you can see why this is interesting if you have a matrix accelerator all of these are matrix multiplies you don't have to use you can use the fastest component of your hardware to compute the inverse pth root and it's parallelizable across many nodes do you have to decide how many steps you do or? Oh, so like this that? is something that we, so there are many algorithms around this. This, even this one, 
when implemented doesn't converge in rare cases, which makes it that rare, even if it's rare, when I say definition of rare, if it happens once a training run, it's bad because you would explode, right? If ever in must be a through, it doesn't work. And you're training for like millions of steps. So what we do is actually we we have a large win number of iterations where we actually check how the error decreases over time. Although there's no guarantee for monotonically decreasing, we have some error bounds. And then once you get too closer to the solution, we cut it off. So we actually typically this runs only for 10 to 15 iterations. If it fails, we actually um, have this code which checks whether there is a failure case. And if we in a failure case, what is the most obvious thing to do? Use the previous preconditioner. Do oh, not sure. use the current update. Yeah. And that works Makes because sense. you know it's delayed by a slightly. And if it's a rare case, then the previous preconditioner is probably OK. And um, yes. I have a question. So this preconditioner thing is pre-calculated, or is it calculated? It's calculated. Like it, uh, from an algorithm point of view, it's calculated at every step. It turns out the shampoo's preconditioner is quite delay tolerant, surprisingly delay tolerant that you only need to compute it once every 10, 100 or 1,000 steps. Like for the mm. transformer problem in the paper, like running it every 1,000 step versus 100 step made no difference in quality. So this is something you can amortize across your training. Group. Although it adds a nuisance hyperparameter because now you need to mm. set that. But usually set it once for the pipeline and forget about it. In practice, how, how often you like to compute it? So it uh, depends on the problem. But uh, for example, if for the ResNet case, because the setting it to one didn't increase the step time, because the step time, because it was a 128 by 128 blocks and it was using much mm -hmm. larger batch size, um, it actually turned out to be a net win because the quality improvement was worth it, right? Yeah. So it was also a competition, right? You're trying to get to the fastest. Yeah. In practice, like, you know, 5%, 10% would, like, you lose out in other ways, right? Yeah. So whereas in the competition, you really need to get to the time, time between start of the program and in the end of no yeah. checkpointing, nothing, right? Like, just try. Uh, <laughs> Pre-compilation. <laughs> no, yeah, pre-compilation. So that's a... Uh, like for that, we said it to one in practice, like for transformers, it's like you would think, I think of it in terms of total number of steps you're training and then maybe have like um, less than 10% of the steps to be the inverse. Mm -hmm. So it's like 10 or above. Um, and what is the default in the API? Just setting then uh, there's a, how often do you want to, there's a, a flag to how often you want to run the preconditioner. You can set it to one, ten, hundred, or a thousand, and then I, it has no default. Like oh, default. Default is I think set to one. But I'll actually uh, in the slides uh, have like if somebody after this talk wants to use shampoo with TRC, they can just copy that set of defaults that work quite well and then use it in their pipeline. I, although that's not actually made the default because shampoo is used for many <laughs> pipelines. It's no. like there's no yeah perfect set of settings for like all use cases. But the ones that I recommend is pretty good to start with. So this is, this one is, this part slide is quite important. Um, this is a rule of thumb that right? if you have a matrix function here, it's inverse pth root. And here kappa m is the condition number of the matrix, which is the maximum eigenvalue divided by the min minimum eigenvalue. This is a symmetric positive definite matrix. You would lose these many bits of precision when you do this operation, right? So just to give an overview, if your condition number of the L matrix or the R matrix is 10 to the power six, you, by definition, if you're computing the inverse fourth root, you would lose 19 bits of precision approximately. So what's left is only four bits of precision, which is quite small. So as the condition number of the matrix get larger and larger, actually the inverse pth root method would fail or like any type, any inverse pth root method would fail, not the ones I've discussed it both before so this becomes a challenge so what we actually do in practice we compute the maximum eigenvalue for each matrix and then we add an epsilon times maximum eigenvalue where the epsilon is set based on the precision of the hardware that you have like the, for the inverse 
So for float 32, you can go up to like 10 to the power minus six, and sometimes all the way to 10 to the power, I would say like most of the time, 10 to the power minus eight is also okay. And beyond that, the inverse will start failing. And so the reason we set it very low and kind of have relative epsilon is that we found that actually setting the epsilon as low as you can gives you better quality. There is no other trade-off. So if you if you had like you know um, high precision available, you would just run inverse with the lowest epsilon possible. Should we answer yeah. the question? <laughs> Yeah, yes, you can um, install, pip install optax shampoo, and then you can use it just like any other optax optimizer. And the slides have some code that you can paste in for the good defaults, which I'll get to. Okay, just for the people who might be it in the future, the question is, can I use it with optax like any optimizer? Uh, and there is a PyPy package, as Rohan pointed out. Um, should, should we talk about this now, or maybe we talk about it uh, further on the slides? Where I'll get... Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so I thought put it in the end of the slide so that people yeah, yeah, yeah. who are super interested in using it <laughs> get get to see. Um, so this is uh, the maximum eigenvalue and minimum eigenvalue for different layers of our trends for the transformer training from some time ago, but we were just plotting it. And you can see for some matrices have like you know condition numbers are quite small for other matrices is quite large, like max by min, that's all it's showing. In large scale settings, especially for like large ads recommendation models, what we do is actually, you know, these inverse peer through need to run every K steps where K is quite large. So let's just not even run it on the TPU, let's run it on the CPUs attached to the host. Because two things, one, you can get used for 64, you can use really nice packages for numerical linear algebra so you'd never have to worry about things failing and uh, you can uh, amortize the cost because this will be run asynchronously so you ship the statistics to the cpu and then you continue training using the preconditioner you have on the tpu and then next time you'd ship the new statistics the old statistics preconditioner is calculated and passed back in so you can amortize the run and we basically essentially make use of extra parallelism that's available. Usually for large models, um, you know, input data pipeline is running on on the host and maybe checkpointing is running. Some of, some of the time it's idle, depending on the model. Usually models that are input bound, there's probably not many CPUs left to do this in wise, but for, you know, for things that are not input bound, this is actually a quite good solution. Is so this that, an option right now in the current implementation? No, for the JAX. Uh, so the for JAX, we uh, um, it, this is not in JAX because in JAX we actually take the approach of let's just run it on the TPU, and I'll get to that design next. So this is some results from the paper on small transformers. We are able to actually beat you know first order methods in both wall clock time using the heterogeneous preconditioning trick. And also for this ads recommendation, uh, external data set as well. So what happens when you want a precondition on device? You need to have basically be able to run inverse peer throat. Now you can run inverse peer throat using high precision, but if high precision isn't available, actually you can emulate high precision using more multiplies. So you can use bfloat16 to emulate float32 and this closely related paper here. What this paper also shows is that actually this is cheaper in terms of overall design energy than actually having the float 32 hardware. So you're using much because we float 60, you can do this float 32 emulation for most close to all the bits in like six passes, approximately six passes, if you get the exact number. So that actually comes out ahead. So that's what we do. We run the emulation. So when I say emulation, XLA takes care of it, and I'll show you some. You need to add a flag called lax dot precision is equal to highest, and I'll start running the exact like high precision multiplies. We use that for ResNet fifty training, where we compare against you know at that time Lars and Nestor moment they were quite good in terms of steps to reach seventy five point nine at this incredibly large max time zone, large number of TPUs. And we find that actually we get the 31.17% reduction in terms of steps and about like 15%-ish uh, 
slightly more than 15 percent dish reduction in uh, wall time and now you can see this is mostly an engineering problem to further decrease it because it's clearly not and that's uh, not optimized as well as we could because the 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 thing that we make a claim in the paper is that as more people use it those parts get optimized even better right things get adapted to it less people use it like you know you hit all the you know errors and you know, slowdowns that could have been avoided so it's it's in a kind of a chicken and egg problem trying to get higher order methods well supported across many devices and you know, platforms we even submitted even a faster version of this using TPU v4 in a ML perf open that's just the link to that with the actual runs and logs and everything so how do we emulate higher precision in JAX? It's quite easy. You just need to pass in lax or precision or highest. If mat M is actually float 32, this will run a full like, actual float 32 multiply. Otherwise, the def def on TPUs. Otherwise, the default one would use B float 16 for the mul part of multiply part of the matrix multiply. Right? And in float 64, you need to add a separate flag in JAX to enable everything to have float 64 support. And then uh, and then you can do this exact same thing. So again, as I said, which arch architecture do you use? If you can, if communication, if you're running the inverse once every K steps, and that's quite large, like five minutes or more, then running it on the CPU is actually cheaper. But if you really need to run it uh, closer, you, you don't want to ship the pre statistics back and forth uh, um, very often for some problems because you know it'll introduce communication delays. Moreover, some problems require the inverse runs every say 10 or 100 steps, in which case run it close to the on the accelerator itself because you can do it. Right? Um, so there are a lot of these uh, decision on JAX implementation essentially only allows you to do one thing, which is to run it on the accelerator. Directly. So, um, how, how does shampoo work? It works in three modes, like one, which is no data parallel, no model parallel. That's just run VMAP across all your statistics and compute the inverse view. In, in terms of VMAP, which is the data parallel setting, what we do is very simple. We take all the statistics and you group them together to some block size, comma block size. Now you can see how block size actually helps here because it allows you to do more parallel work. And you combine all of them and batch them to num devices. And once every, say, 50 steps, you run this in parallel across hosts, we map it within the host, and then collect the results at the end. So it's get the data, uh, get the appropriate device, compute inverse peer through, and gather the results. This is the parallel, like naive parallelism for PMAP inverse peer through. So that's what we do. However, this has a problem. It's expensive memory-wise because you have to collect all the statistics in each device again as a group. So it's already there in the device, but we have to group them again. So you have like a constant factor overhead that's not as cool. Right? And I'll talk about different ways we get around this and reduce the cost. And so we use this actually for different research work here with proof in Brain Zurich. We used it to train um, distillation faster in this consistent matching regime where we compare against Adam. We are able, in one of the regimes, we are actually able to see a much larger improvement about 4x in convergence. And recently, this was used in text to 3D model, which is the dream fusion, which is quite cool. Uh, uh, and they use it to train, I guess, optimize the nerve parameters quite well. And they use it for with like, you know, um, 1500 iterations and hyperparameters are actually in the, uh, in the paper. So we have some, mem so you can see like how shampoo uses much more memory than uh, Adam, for example. So we actually have some more to improve the memory usage. So if you set this to true, which you should set, there's no reason not to set. And Boris actually helped kind of test some of these changes and actually improved one thing where we accidentally quantized diagonal statistics to be float 16 and that turned out to be a really bad idea and uh, so we rolled it back to float 32. so what we do is for statistics and preconditional which are these symmetric matrices we do uh, uniform quantization and do in 16. 
However, what we to do uniform quantization, we take the diagonal entries out, which are these G squares, and keep that in float 32. And this technique actually works quite well. For momentum, we store it in in eight. So what quite... does it mean? What does it mean when uh, isn't it like a float number? How what does oh, it so mean? So the eight in works eight? takes by take the absolute value of the float number, compute the maximum value, and then divide zero to maximum into six two to the power mm -hmm. you know fifteen okay. buckets. Okay. So you can have negative. Range. So that's yeah, that's so zero centered uniformly quantized. So now we have storing integers, and whenever you need to use it, you have to convert it back to a float. So you would multiply it by the um, max value so to get the float, and then bring back it in float thirty two when you need to run an operation. So you also keep the max value somewhere. Somewhere. So, but the max value is um, in this case the max value is stored per row. So it's you know again mm -hmm. like a diagonal. Right. So overall storage is uh, 3.5x weights if you do quantization plus some overheads every 50 steps because of the collection of all the statistic. Uh, and Adam uses 2x in float 32. Although the Adam also has variations like 8-bit Adam, for example, which makes it even cheaper. But if you're using the default Adam, then you probably can afford shampoo with the same model up to some size. Uh, but um, if we really are going in the scaling axis and increasing the number of parameters for better quality, you would probably use model parallelism, like use PGIT. In that case, it actually allows you to shard the optimizer states across all devices so that the overhead per device is actually quite small, although the checkpoints are quite large, as Boris would tell you, because it's huge. <laughs> But, uh, but by the way, even if you don't do model parallelism, um, if you use PGIT, you still take care of the advantage of absolutely, the... absolutely. Yeah. So you can use. So I would even. Rec okay. I don't know if I should. If you can use PGIT in data parallel mode, where you only shard the optimizer states, and that's actually a quite good mode. And actually, Boris has a few changes to even make that quite fast. Uh, uh, yeah. So no, it goes fast. And... Yeah. It avoids the overhead, I guess. In model parallel setting, uh, now you get to the actual uh, flags and details. You can actually pass in these four flags. One, you want you want to say you want to shard the optimizer state. True, true. Num devices is the number of accelerators you have. So you know, eight, sixteen, sixty-four, whichever you want to set. And then statistics and preconditioner in the model parallel setting is is a 3D tensor. So the first dimension is the number of statistics, and the second and third is the block size. So you just give it a partition spec, which tells Jax how to shard it across many devices. So if you say if you have a 2D mesh where you have two axes, axis 1 and axis 2, if you say you want to split the block size by block size dimension, which is axis 1 and axis 2, just pass that partition spec. And for preconditioner, you want to actually have parallelism, so you want to partition the first axis because you want to run inverse via through in parallel across all devices. But you can save memory by also sharding the last axis, so you don't touch that axis. So that's all it just does, and this basically completely obviates the overhead in the optimizer per device, so you can use large more train large models. Okay? And actually, you, Boris is first one to actually use this. Well, for crayon training, where he scaled it up to 2.5 billion parameter transformers using, I think at that time he was using 1D axis parallelism, but now I think like he has to do 2D as well. So it seems to work. And when you use the, I don't remember the number of devices for PGIT, is it the local number or the total number of the. So in the 2D case, it's the total number. Okay. In the 1D case, this needs to be the axis of one. If I remember yeah. So yeah, this but then by the time you run PG, essentially like this information is already in your mind. So kind of yeah. just set that there. Yeah. It's otherwise a bit confusing because it depends on the model set. So um Boris and I used it to oh this is the first time shampoo was used for training the Dali mini 
mini model. Uh, so we're what is this running experiments with different uh, optimizers, add a factor, add them and distributed shampoo. And this is, uh, you know, different learning rate tuning of it. And we found that actually shampoo works well. The other, other optimizers kind of explored halfway in, even if it was doing well, all up to like 10 K steps. So, and it was better in terms of evaluation time to result and think, yeah, you know, first you want to add anything here. Just I think what it. was, uh, I think to me, what was even more interesting is like on the small model, I thought, oh, maybe it's not necessarily needed, uh, but it actually still worked well, even on the small model. But the main reason, even when I, why I started using it is because it was, I couldn't keep training stable on 1 billion parameter. It was like di diverging and it was bad. And uh, with any optimizer, like uh, I had other factor initially, and then I put Adam and I'm like, okay, problem solved. And just a bit later, it started diverting again. And uh, I think that's what where it was even more a big win. It was like, a, on the small model, OK, it converged faster, which is already nice. But on big model, it converges <laughs> versus it diverges. So it was like a pretty big win. <laughs> With no trick in architecture and all, it, it was nice. So when I had the larger architecture, I really needed to change some things around. but with a trick it was nice that it could suddenly work yeah so great the i guess the current crayon model was trained using shampoo so i used it to generate some <laughs> distributed shampoo bottles so exactly the talk you run it in parallel keep sure and shampoo it was <laughs> so one thing i didn't say so far which has become crucial for shampoo to work and practice is this uh notion of learning rate schedule and how we set that. So the key idea is that we disentangle shampoo's direction from the update direct step, step size. So we use shampoo's direction for each layer independently, but you use a first order method to propose the step size at each step. So there's always a first order method that's parallel proposing these step sizes at, for each layer. So the way we do that is by taking shampoo's direction, removing the, you know, the scale, because you're going to use the step size from another method that proposes the magnitude. So what we actually set is to a variant of RMS prop where we normalize to uh, avoid like big scale changes. Um, and this generally works well across many tasks. Uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, for the long running online task, we actually use the adagrad schedule because it usually doesn't have an end, end time. But if you have a fixed horizon training, this RMS prop normalized with your classic cosine schedule seems to work quite well. Why why do you need to disentangle the the learning rate? So you can. My take is that shampoo is an approximation to the full matrix adagrad, and the full matrix adagrad was derived in the convex online setting. In practice, you have you need learning rate schedule, like setting the learning rate and the schedule is probably the most important thing in a pipeline, more than an optimizer. So it's hard to get the scale to match. So there's an implicit bias in how the I guess the optimizer step size is based on the map that we just proposed, which makes it actually doesn't work for deep learning models. Whereas thinking in terms of, you know, shampoo is proposing some preconditioning, it's kind of changing the direction, yeah. but then we don't know how far we should go. So let's okay, just okay. do something that we already know. That makes Not sense. So shampoo is good. Yeah, shampoo is good at giving the direction and uh, the step is computed, needs to be computed separately. But Separate. when the step is computed, it, it takes into consideration the new direction of shampoo? Or... No, it's as if like that optimizer never gets to run. It's just computing mm. its direction. So Can it one... create an issue then? Y yeah, the, a great question. It so far hasn't. So this is always a question that reviewers also ask when we submit the graph. <laughs> Like, hey, what about the trajectory? But hey, deep learning, it doesn't seem to directionally matter. Doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, another thing I wanted to say is that this actually has another advantage, 
when we started trying to make shampoo work, you know, it's not like it just ripples an algorithm and it just works everywhere, right? It turns out this method is actually quite useful. If you have a well-tuned problem with some optimizer, you can make your pro step proposals be based on that optimizer's step size and plug in shampoo's direction. So you can get all the benefits of maybe somebody proposes an adaptive weight decay schedule with certain momentum with certain warm up, right? You can use all of that, but just change the preconditioner to use shampoo. So then you don't have to do hyperparameter tuning and you get pretty much like better results than what that optimizer gave, which is kind of fascinating. So it's like zero shot transfer across optimizer tuning. That's cool. So here is the actual um, B map, which is probably what most people are gonna look for. So once you install pip install Optax shampoo, you can set your basic hyperparameters that you want. This this set of settings is generally good. You can choose to whether to use weight decay or not. The P map axis is the batch axis. If you set if you don't set this, then assuming it's like single host without any P map. And here is the here is the setting for actual block diagonalization, where we talked about blocking different gradients into smaller sizes. You can set to five and twelve. If you sometimes usually have like a soft max layer or an embedding layer that's really large. So you might want to skip preconditioning that altogether to save on compute. So you can set that dimension to be 2048. So if any tensor has dimension greater than 2048, we would skip it. This is like the question you had, how often do you want to set it? You can set it to 10, but I would typically say start at 10 and like see which one works for your pipeline because it depends on the batch size, compute infra and other things. You can leave this here. This is the epsilon that I talked about. Generally, smaller the better. When do you start preconditioning shampoo? 1001 is a good, if you're training for hundreds of thousands of steps, start shampoo at a uh, thousand step, and that's fine. Uh, here, what happens is that, you know, initially, all, initially you don't have enough um, signal to actually compute the inverse. So this also helps kind of stability to not run shampoo immediately it says step zero. And then crafting mode, leave it there. And this is also the default. So this is what you do. And if you want to run it on module parallel, replace batch axis with the sharding configuration. So this is what you have to do to get shampoo to run. And this setting is usually like kind of works quite well in practice. I have a question. Because this is what I was trying to do, like I don't know, like three weeks ago. Um, is 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 there like a JIT version, like just JIT? Yeah. So if you remove the batch axis as of so updated the PyPy package, if you set this to none, that's the JIT version. Mm. So everything else you can set because that's just the hyperparameters of the algorithm. If you set the batch axis is equal to none, that's just the Non P map, non PJIT version, but it still gets you the parallelism because underlying it'll use V map to run the inverse be through. I'll, I'll try it again. Uh, do, do you think right now with the latest update you made, it's let's say for non for a non distributed case, it's just like a plug and play with other yeah yeah, it, of it, yeah. yeah it okay. should be a plug and play. The only caveat is that. If you are running in the JIT world with only one GPU, you may not have enough parallelism to run the inverse peer through. So now you have to have the trade-off of, hey, is the step time worth getting to the solution faster? And mm -hmm. what is the quality? Is there a quality wall-time trade-off that you can make for that problem? Yeah, that, that would be interesting. I, I know this is all in the context of like, I guess, um, large models, yeah. but I don't know, I was uh, trying to play with, let's say a more regular, um, doing like a hobby project. Uh, but I, I still think that maybe for stability, it could be nice to yeah, like try yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I'll try it again. Um, but it, it, I was telling Boris, it might be like, uh, I know for, for people who are just starting because uh, I don't know, maybe it's easier to start just say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna replace Adam and then like scale up. 
it might be like um i guess a a better path towards uh, actually becoming like a like a user because i i know it's not like easy in the end uh, uh, because i know one, yeah I know the details Boris has gone through uh, <laughs> to to build a model such that it works with distributed shampoo. Um, like Boris fights a lot with uh, how, how to structure the parameters of, of the layers. Ah, because Boris uses scan. Yeah, scan. So I unscan. No, I don't unscan. But then I vmap shampoo over the scan layer. Or mm -hmm. I, this is like little things that typically you don't necessarily need immediately. <laughs> but this uh, is like yeah. training like 2 billion parameter transform. Yeah, also when you use PGIT, you have to you have to learn about, about partition specs. So the optimizer is wrapped into a fake optimizer, I would say, right? So that you can access the P spec function, the partition spec function. And, um, but I guess the PMAP doesn't need that, right? The PMAP is more straightforward, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. PMAP is just just changing the optimizer, and that's yeah. probably where most of the users are when yeah. they start out too, right? So it should just be a plug and play. I have a, I have another question. Um, I mean, I, I saw Matt's uh, GTC talk, and I was kind of mind blown. <laughs> Where he was showing that uh, maybe in the future, PGIT is just going to be JIT. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. I haven't voicing. seen that. Yeah, I haven't seen that talk, but uh, makes sense. It was amazing. Like, um, I wonder, like, if if that direction changes somehow the the API, or it's still kind of the same. From from a shampoo's perspective, um, I would say like if the changes would be minimal, like it would be like you know even I'm not sure about the new API, like the new way of doing things, but assume there is some way of expressing the parallelism, and we would express it that way, right? So there would be some changes needed depending on what that changes. Uh, but yeah, it should be a straightforward change because yeah, you know, like I, th I think the change, as I understood it, is that the partition, um, like spec, is or the, yeah the partition information, or the they call it the the sharding information is now contained in the array itself. Uh, in the parameter, I guess in this context, oh, that might make the code even cleaner, right? You don't have to pass. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that would be amazing. Uh, so, so you're saying, uh, yeah, maybe we can infer it. Yeah, um, I mean, like, I feel like this is a, the the solution would be for all PGIT users, right? Because everyone's need to do this exact same thing. So, probably have that version supported as well when it comes out. Mm. Okay, interesting. Right. All right. So, one cool project, if someone's looking for one is there's this amazing work by Godam Zhang, Alex Botov, and uh, James Martins from 2021. What they do is actually get rid of a skip connection and batch norm from a ResNet. So what you are left with is a net. And they get they train with KFAC and Shampoo to extremely high accuracy. And those are the only two optimizers that work on that problem. It'd be really cool to someone to you know implement that model and try it with distributed Shampoo. The outcome is that the it's a much more efficient model because there's no skip connection and batch norm. And so the idea is like it would it would be faster at inference and train faster too by not having those layers. Yeah, and like you know, but any issue that batch norm may or may yeah. not have at scale will all be avoided, right? Batch norm has so many hyperparameters, right? Like virtual batch norm. This in the distributed setting, not in the uh, single machine setting. So all that is over. But th th that is also very interesting because it's it's really like a deep network now. Yeah, and it trains really well with shampoo and KFAC specifically. Ah, uh, nice. I wanna wanna look at that paper because 
I know there there was some notion that maybe like deep nets were kind of linearish because of all the skip connections. Wonder if there's a qualitative change if they're now truly deep. No, uh, do check the paper because at init time you do try to make sure certain properties of the network hold. So, but then it is truly deep from your perspective. You know, yes, there's no skip and much more. So I have a question. I have yet to go through my local prop slides and <laughs> then we might be over time. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I think it's, yeah, it's up to you. I uh, I know it works as anything, but there is no official, like we have to end it right now. So yeah, you won't go ahead. Hey, I can, uh, Boris. No, I'm you. good. Hey, right, cool. All right, so this is our recent work on enhancing backprop with local loss optimization with its joint work with Hassan Ahmed and Manfred Bermud. Um, so backprop, this is just a general overview of uh, local prop and we're very excited by this. So backprop is uh, essentially applying chain rule to multi-layer neural network. It involves taking a mini batch of examples, running a forward prop, and I'll just bring out the notation now. The pre-activations are A hats of M and post activations after applying an activation function is y hats of m. And forward pass involves computing the loss. Backward pass involves taking a gradient with respect to the weights and taking updates with some optimizer. So now you can look at the gradient with respect to the weights, apply chain rule. It's the gradient of the loss with respect to the pre-activations and gradient of the pre-activations with respect to the weights. And this term essentially is y hats of m in case of uh, linear fully connected network, right, with no biases. So previous work in this area of trying to enhance backprop uh, included synthetic gradient, fringe lifted networks, and different target propagation. And largely the focus in DL optimization has been improving the direction of backprop or by adding momentum and exponential moving average and preconditioning, as I just described in the talk, right? Here we look at it differently. Um, so this is just, again, notation. So remember that A hats of M is the pre-activation and YM is the post. So it's the input to the next layer. So what do we do? We actually improve the backprop uh, step by repeatedly applying local updates to each layer, so multiple steps. If you run one step of local prop, it's the same as backprops. So you don't change anything multiple steps improve the solution. It's computationally cheap and memory efficient. The local updates after doing the backward pass in setting targets, which I'll explain, is completely decoupled. So you're running these updates to each layer in parallel across all layers. It's applicable to any layer with non-decreasing transfunction, and it gives you flexibility in kind of setting different targets for every layer and different losses and you can apply any optimizer. You can use any first order method to optimize it. So there are two algorithms that are in the paper, local prop S, and which stands for squared loss, M for matching loss, which takes into account the activation function. For easy uh, understanding, I'm just going to focus on local prop S because it's very simple to set up. Um, so this is where there was an animation. So I'm going to use this kind of uh, show you the animation here. So this is from our block post. So you run a forward pass, compute. And then in the backward pass, you compute gradients with respect to each of the pre-activation and set that as targets. And then you those targets are now your new labels, and you have a loss function, which is squared loss for each layer. And they run independently in parallel and applied through multiple steps. And that's it. Local prop is that simple to implement did you run. did you do one first update before that or not no so you could because the first step of local prop is identical yeah. but in our case we just run a backward pass um, to compute the mm -hmm. uh, targets for each neuron which is the current value minus like the gradient of that target of other the neuron so that's mm -hmm. yeah I have um, a question. Maybe I missed it. What, what is each intermediate layer? Uh, 
what are the targets for the intermediates? So the target is defined as the following. For this is the pre-activation minus negative direction of the gradient with respect to the uh, target of, with respect to each of the neurons. Uh, it's trying to predict the gradient in the first step. So yes, in so if you do one step, it becomes backprop. If you do multiple step, I'll explain. So here is the loss function that we set up. It's a squared loss. For each layer, we are trying to match the targets A, A M that we just created. And you have a regularizer. And then you're trying to optimize for this loss. It turns out if you try to optimize, get to the minima, this is as a closed form. A closed form is essentially the gradient preconditioned on the right, which is the, one of the preconditioners. You can think of it as an implicit gradient or the right preconditioner of shampoo and QFAC. But we actually don't compute this, instantiate this preconditioner at all and take the inverse. Instead, we um, do fixed point iterations to uh, get to the solution. So we don't actually, uh, we run like, you know, five to 10 steps of um, local gradient descent with some uh, preconditioning operation like using Adam or RMS prop. And here, this is showing that the first step is essentially backprop. It recovers. If you do one step up on that loss, you get backprop back. So for this, we actually use deep auto encoder for us as our benchmark problem. Um, we use it ex extensively for second order methods because this is one place where you can clearly differentiate different types of preconditioners. Um, we do extensive tuning, different activation functions and model sizes. We compare shampoo and KFAC. So what we find is that on the single GPU setting, a local prop in for deep networks beat KFAC and shampoo. At five and at 50, essentially, is the how often the inverse is running. So the flag that I talked about earlier in the previous talk, we can see that you have the trade-off here. Here, the trade-off is how many iterations you want to run. And it turns of five to 10 iterations is sufficient to get good quality results. Why is local prop exciting? Now we have completely removed the need for any high precision inverse. We have completely parallelized after the first update of setting the targets, all the layers. And we have this notion of local loss. We can do many things with local loss, and we've been working on many new exciting things that combine shampoo and local prop. What, uh, what the, the, when you update the parameter, how does the learning rate compare to when you would do only one update? So the learning rate for the actual uh, Update is about the same, but there is an, another learning rate that is introduced as a hyperparameter, which is the learning rate for setting the targets. This is quite yeah. large that you have to set. Oh, it's a large? Yeah, it's quite large. But this is okay. set. Uh, so it adds another hyperparameter, two hyperparameters, the learning rate for setting the targets and also mm. the um, number of iterations you want to run. And what, what is your understanding of, of the effect it does versus doing one single update, doing like a lot of micro updates? It's like visualize better the, I, I don't know. How, how do you understand it intuitively? So great question. So I think so for local prop, you run one backward pass and now everything is completely parallel. So that's the advantage it brings. You could instead run forward pass, backward pass, case steps. But now for every backward pass, it's sequentially dependent. So you would use a lot mm -hmm. more computational cost. Okay. So local prop parallelizes multiple updates across layers, which is a cool thing. So memory-wise, it's much, much, much smaller than second order. Yeah, uh, you would need to store the targets, which is batch size times number of activation to set the loss. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's the same cost as applying a first order update to the problem. So it's much cheaper. Do you keep an EMA? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, you would use RMS prop, which already includes the EMA. Oh, do you keep the EMA for the targets? No, we did, we just did gradient descent for the targets. Okay. So it's like same as Adam, memory-wise. The same as Adam, yeah. But each step is a bit slower. It's Yeah, so it, it's K times B times M times N. Mm -hmm. So 
So now the question is, when could that be useful? So it depends on the configuration of hardware and things that you're in. What is cool about local prop is that it matches uh, second order methods and, and in wall time actually beats it for really deep auto encoders. So we are able to actually get much, much better results. So do you think it could, oh, go ahead, Christian. No, no, go ahead and then I'll ask. I will have a million questions or <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if, if is there like a, an intuitive picture of what it's doing? Oh yeah, you can, so that's, uh, so we set these targets. So, and then we're doing local loss optimization. So intuitively the first step is just backdrop. Multiple steps essentially is preconditioning the gradient because it's an explicit solution for that. So you can think of it as a preconditioner being applied. Mm. But what we did with local prop is because we are running iteration, multiple iterations, we don't need to actually explicitly compute the preconditioner. So that gives us some flexibility in selecting how off. So maybe initial thousand steps, we run only one step of local prop and then increase the steps as we train longer. So, so it's at each step giving a better estimate of the preconditioner. That's kind of the idea. Exactly. Or, or get, getting closer to the solution to the local loss problem, which is essentially the preconditioned update. Okay, interesting. So so it, it would shift the direction a little bit every time. Every time to get to the oh. yeah. And there's and the questions you're asking, there's a lot of interesting details around like you know. Exactly, like which, what are we actually going after? Is it the implicit update? Is it the second order update? And there's a lot of interesting new work. In that. Can you estimate stuff beyond second order using this kind of stuff? Like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Too crazy. Um, yeah, so. Are you? Yeah, go ahead. No, are, are you, what what, uh, what optimizer excites you the most now, like the distributed shampoo or the local prop? So I would say local prop is a framework that allows us to instantiate different optimization methods. In um, for for in practice, as of today, you probably sh if you have large number of TPUs, you probably should use distributed shampoo for your problem. But if you have the time, if you have a single machine problem or you have a model parallel problem, and you're willing to implement local prop because now local prop is now a meta technique you have to set the local loss and keep multiple updates then you should try that local prop is quite new so for example in our paper we only showed results on deep order encoders the, we have some work coming out which combines certain qualities of these local losses with better pre to form better preconditioners which would be i think like somewhere in the between where it's practical but it's still not fully local so there's a yeah. I have, have, have a question. Uh, because you said layer wise, but actually, in the it's, if you're going to implement it, it's per parameter? Like, yeah. So you, actually, parallelism is per neuron. Yeah. Per, per pre activation. It's much more parallel than um, anything. So, we just uh, separated it as layers because it's easier to explain. But mm -hmm. Once we set the target for one pre-activation, all the edges connecting it can be updated independently of other edges. But you may want to keep them together for fully connected layers because the inputs are shared, right? So there's mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so yeah, per, per parameter. Wondering per, how, uh, how per an API yeah. would look for this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That is exactly the challenge for this, and then stay tuned. And actually, I would say, like, I looked at LG, and that looks quite nice for um, doing something like this. In my, I think, I think this is so custom. You probably need like your own <laughs> mini framework. Um, yeah, I know. Interesting thinking about this API wise. Uh, so, so you need a, 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 you need a loss per parameter, and that has to be kind of an output also. Um, you need a loss per parameter, uh, and yes, so it's like you would need the regular way of setting up uh, final loss, 
then you need a secondary stage of setting these targets and local losses. So you need like a way to instantiate the forward function again independently. So you can maybe vmap over them. Do you think this can be done without modifying, let's say, flux? Could, 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 could you do it without modifying existing layers? Or you think you need to modify the layers themselves? So the flux uh, offers this module methods that might allow us to actually make use of, essentially, call the functions again. Um, that would be useful. But the training loop definitely changes. And the question with the training loop then becomes on, on like, you know, um, not recomputing things that have been computed already. How do you do memory management and making sure you're not storing buffers that for longer than necessary and things of that nature? Could it be just uh, optax, optax, uh, <laughs> an optax optimizer or not? Like that so, has the gradient, so it knows the target, so it knows. No, because it doesn't have the structure of the network, I guess. Right. So, so it... that's why in the okay. So we are work coming soon. You can overload the uh, J, uh, VJPs for different activation functions to basically do what you're saying. Where is in the back prop, we can get the gradients of the pre-activation, and then um, in that approach, we don't get to run multiple iteration, but you can actually apply the preconditioner exactly to find the solution so that actually does work but now it change changes the algorithm slightly or maybe if you pass it the apply function to the optimizer like yes something I have. ah yeah it could work because there you have the parameters so yeah okay. but it's kind of when you have residual residual connections and all that you have local loss that are depending on parameters from everywhere and interconnections everywhere it becomes doesn't become like a bit messy it does <laughs> right like, hey as we shown like you don't need those yeah. connections and match norm right those two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what, all right that's the solution then just get rid of them <laughs> yeah like they're messing everything up. <laughs> that's a good way uh, so so if i understood boris comment uh, this would need to be per operation or why is removing the skip connections like easier? No, no, skip connection adds more yeah, choices probably. on yeah. what should be the pre-activation and which groups of layers to train together. Oh, okay. So it, just, it just adds more choices, right? So it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it will be tricky to remove them in like super resolution unit model and things like that. Yeah. I think you may, you may have <laughs> a trouble convincing people to take them out. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a project. I mean, it might work. <laughs> yeah, and it well, transformers also use skip connections, right? Are yeah. they stable without them? Uh, I think for transformers, I don't think anyone has shown removing, or as far as I understand, I don't think anyone has shown that removing actually can train to the same quality. So skip connection so far is still there, but something that is open. I think it could. I could see it working for transformer, for unit, you know, that go like super shallow, uh, super deep and like uh, yeah. and narrow. I don't know if that intuitively, if it seems like a, I, I could see the case for transformer for unit. I don't know. <laughs> and if, if it does work for unit is, uh, I guess if unit has this uh, skipping a connection like cross blocks of the same size yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah keep the higher information has like anyone that. updated how important that is imagine the original unit paper but read it too long Maybe. ago i don't remember yeah so my yeah there might be like so you think of since it's the same thing where it probably helps with better optimization because it's closer it's like an identity mapping and close to that. So if you, you know, initialize the network and carefully set the parameters, it might be possible to use second order methods to kind of train units without skip. 
It's pretty cool. Very interesting optimizers. Very interesting talk. I, I'm happy to finally learn about shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> How it works. Yeah, th thanks for the invite and thanks for co-hosting. It's been great. Yeah, no, Rohan, it was really nice. I, I think I learned a lot. Um, one last question, uh, which is curiosity of mine. Um, it seems, well, I know I was chatting with Boris the other day. Um, like, I don't know, I, I've seen uh, like this local prop uh, seems, and I don't know if distributed shampoo, uh, it, it's also the case. Uh, it, it seems there is kind of a, I don't know, like a, the idea of maybe doing certain calculations that might involve, let's say, multiple steps, or in your case, multiple, how do you call mm -hmm. them, like descent steps. For example, I don't know, I was reading the, the uh, look ahead paper, which mm -hmm. was kind of, oh, well, we're going to just Look, look around the neighborhood and, and then average yeah. coverage and in my mind that's kind of to calculate like a better direction i guess mm -hmm. um so yeah great point because if you pass the same data across the look ahead steps it's sort of doing multiple steps of backdrop right and then averaging in the optimize, it, they do mention that in the paper as like you could use the same batch to do multiple steps and then average, but in practice they use different uh, batches across steps because so plus yeah definitely see this type of idea like you know multiple steps to improve the training in like multiple places. Okay, interesting. You, you think this is kind of the future of optimizers? Like, oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's very broad, broad clean, but it's something that uh, I would say this, right? Like, um, maybe we are stuck with uh, first order methods because that's the easiest thing that we can get working without painful API changes. Uh, I didn't talk about KFAC. That's a method that works extremely well, but you need to apply it for different layers more carefully and compute preconditioners. And so there seems to be like, as we get to more advanced optimization, it seems that, you know, APIs and implementation challenges actually become bigger than for startup methods. And that might be one reason that we haven't tried these techniques across many models and you know the models and optimizers kind of co-evolve in some sense where you tune all the model changes based on a fixed optimizer so then it's gonna like we might discover fewer things because we try optimizers that are similar to each other whereas like you know shampoo is very similar to adam it's uses slightly more information but it get even there's enough evidence that it is showing different behavior in different models, like removing skip from batch norm. So there's probably a lot more there. And it's, and I think the engineering problem of better APIs actually is a critical part of making these things work and discovering new things. I have another question. Um, well, I mean, it, it's one of these future questions, but do you think there's a point where, because currently Adam is kind of the default, like I don't know, if I don't know what to do, I default to Adam. I, I think a lot of people do that. And, mm -hmm. yeah. but do, do you think maybe there, there'll be a time that the default is like more advanced because I, I feel like I've been using that Adam seven, since seven years ago. So it's kind of, well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and so so do I guess the default is something that works out of the box, but it turns out like yeah, it's hard to predict how things would evolve, right? Like for example, Adam has bias correction, which is like a warm up, 
and momentum and moving averages. So it works quite well as this like out of the box algorithm. Um, going to higher order methods, you already saw like there are like five different extra hyperparameter flags. Although these are like you know not things that you have to tune too much, but still something that cognitively adds cost to setting up in a new pipeline. So yeah, um, I think uh, maybe in the future automating and kind of having like you know these hyperparameters be set by the system itself based on what you're training would make it extremely useful might make whatever that new thing is like something that actually automatically sets how often should you precondition if that is the hyperparameter that exists in the future or like you know uh, what should be the better to be what could be set that based on the batch size can we observe like you know the noise in the mini batch try to increase the batch size till the regime where we get most effective utilization of the accelerator that you're using so there are these all these um, things that we do as uh, as part of setting up a pipeline that i think could be quite automated and that's i think might be the like you know future of better optimizing by, by automating you mean like auto ml kind of thing or you mean that the oh no and it's like uh, i would say like you know so we think of optimizers as like, oh, you set these hyperparameters and then you kick off a run, right? But it's usually an iterative process of training multiple models and everything, right? right? So really what we should be doing is that having systems that are automatic, like do some of this work for us in terms of like, you know, um, what should be, like I have eight accelerators. What is the right batch size to use so that I can effectively utilize those accelerators as well as trained stably and get you good performance, right? Yeah. This is something that can be automated in some That's some true. loop somewhere, right? And today we we do that loop by kind of hill climbing up. I, I, I heard a comment somewhere that like we're gonna get AGI when we have an AI that does the optimization, something like that. Uh, so so yeah, you're suggesting smart. having a really smart system that does the <laughs> So, sort of configure the optimizer like <laughs> that's what like... Rohan is doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> no yeah now now our entire job is to choose those parameters and Rohan is like oh i, I should choose them for you <laughs> we have five parameters to choose now that's the entire job <laughs> it's like prompting the optimizer <laughs> Oh, no, really, to, really cool. To get training data from just get get Boris to do hyperparameter tuning and learn from Boris, <laughs> and that 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 is your your algorithm. Um, yeah, Ron, thanks a lot. I enjoyed the talk a lot. I yeah, guess. it was great uh, giving you an overview. Thanks for the invite. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, um, I'm gonna end the stream. Uh, we can.